Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including John Atwood, Pat, and Mike Cortez. On this episode of DTNS, AMD has the biggest announcements from Computex. There's a big problem with Microsoft's recall security. And Shannon Morris is here to talk about that and whether YouTube is its own TV category now. This is the Daily Tech News for Monday, June 3rd, 2024 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. In Studio Colorado, I'm Shannon Morse. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Hey, everybody, it's Bing's 15th birthday. Don't halt Yay. here at once. <laughs> <laughs> no, fifth, fifth. Bing's having a quinceanera. 15 you know. years? Oh, wow. Good for Bing. Yeah. Can we, we buy Bing a present? Yeah, Can, yeah. They should throw. Should, <laughs> Bing should throw a little party, and then we'll all show up and eat cake and dance, and yeah, it'll be yeah. good. Congrats, Yay. Bing. You know, uh, they they pointed out on Therat.com that Bing itself was the successor of Live Search. I forgot all about Microsoft mm-hmm. Live Search and MSN Search. Microsoft had search engines before Bing. Oh, Bing goodness. was almost just a rebranding. <laughs> Anyway, oh, happy old. 15th birthday <laughs> to Bing. Next year, Bing can drive in the United States. Uh, let's start with the quick hits. Sony announced the PlayStation VR 2 PC adapter that works with a few thousand games on Steam, connects to a PC with a DisplayPort 1.4 cable. Sony recommends that the PC you're connecting it to should have at least an Intel Core i5-7600 or AMD Ryzen 3 3100 CPU and either an NVIDIA GeForce RTX 3060 or AMD Radeon RX 6600 XT or newer, uh, but at least those. You'll also need Sony's VR2 app for Windows, as well as the Steam VR app. And you should know that headset feedback, eye tracking, eye tracking, adaptive triggers, and haptic feedback aren't gonna work on the PC. The PSVR2 PC adapter sells for 60 bucks, unless you're in Europe, in which case it sells for 60 euros, which makes it slightly more expensive. Uh, in the UK, it's 50 pounds and it ships on August 7th. Uh, Speaking of companies that want your money, Spotify is raising its U.S. prices again a year after its first price rise. Spotify Premium goes up from $10.99 to $11.99 a month starting next month. Spotify Duo is going from $14.99 to $16.99 a month. And the family plans go from $16.99 up to $19.99. Yeah. They raised it for international last month or two two months ago or something, not that long ago. So this was coming. Computex kicked off in Taiwan. So let's go through some of the big announcements there. Asus announced its ROG Ally X handheld gaming PC available for pre-orders. It's $799 ship in July 22nd. Has twice the battery, twice the storage, and twice the USB-C ports of the previous version. There's a lot of design changes in here, a lot. Uh, go what, read the Verge article. They did a great job documenting all of that. But it's still the same chipset and still the same display. So it's essentially a revision of the previous one. Asus also announced three new form factors for its Pro Art line. The P16 is a traditional laptop with a Pantone validated 4K OLED panel running on AMD's Ryzen 9 AI 300 processors. We're going to talk about those in a minute, uh, but that means it's a Copilot Plus PC. You can also add a GeForce RTX 4070 GPU, up to 64 gigs of memory, and four terabytes of storage, up to that. Uh, The physical dial for selecting settings, if you're familiar from that from the previous versions, has been worked into the touchpad. So it's still there, it's just not its own thing. PX13 is a 13.1 inch two-in-one convertible with a 3K display, still have the Pantone validation and the dial in the touchpad. It also has the AI 300 processors and the PZ13 is the third new one in this series. It is a 13-inch 3K OLED tablet running on Qualcomm's Snapdragon X. Ooh, I'm so excited about those. During the keynote at Computex, Qualcomm CEO Cristiano Amon implied users of laptops running on its chips will not need to carry around chargers since the power efficiency will be good enough to use as long as they want. Qualcomm also showed a life with PC form factors as well as laptops using the Snapdragon X chip. The first laptops with the Snapdragon X chipsets will arrive June 18th. Amon also claimed that Snapdragon 
Snapdragon X battery life will be as much as twice that of traditional laptops. Qualcomm generated some buzz by using the actor Justin Long, the, who is famous for being the Mac in the older I'm a Mac, I'm a PC commercials from 2006, if you're older like I am, in a skit for the keynote that Long switched from a Mac to a PC running a Qualcomm chip. <gasps> oh, my gosh. Uh, I know. <laughs> uh, uh, and then NVIDIA announced the successor to the Blackwell model chips called Rubin. Uh, Blackwell was just announced in March. Uh, this faster announcement is part of NVIDIA's new cadence. They're going to announce new AI chip tech every year rather than every two years. Uh, NVIDIA also gem demonstrated G Assist. That is a chatbot that can help you play games. One example they showed was it answering a question on which game weapon that you should develop next and where to go find the crafting materials for it in the game. It can also do non-gaming things if you think that's cheating. Uh, it can optimize your display settings, stuff like that. NVIDIA also announced the SFF Ready Enthusiast GeForce Cards program. That's not sci-fi fantasy. That's small form factor. Uh, the program will match GeForce Cards with small form factor cases. Uh, significantly, it doesn't mean that every card in the program is actually small form factor. They've got some two and a half inch cards in there, but they are saying though even those cards can work in small form factor cases based on this program. So it's, it's a way to match things up if you're working on a small form factor case. All right, one more thing from Computex. AMD CEO Lisa Su uh, got on stage and said that AI is now the number one priority for everyone in the world, including AMD. Uh, the Ryzen AI 300 series was her main announcement that will power Microsoft Copilot Plus laptops. So along with Qualcomm Snapdragon X and Intel's Lunar Lake. Uh, it is the third of the series of CPUs that can power a laptop that gets the Copilot Plus designation. First releases for those are coming in July. They are built on the Zen 5 architecture. A new naming convention changes HX. Uh, HX used to mean something else, but now it just means it's the best and the fastest. Doesn't have to do with battery life or anything like that. Ryzen AI 300 chips have XDNA2, for the neural processing unit, RDNA 3.5 for the iGPU, and up to 16 compute units. The Ryzen AI 9 HX 370 and the AI 9 365 are the top two in the series, and both have 50 teraflop MPUs. Uh, we've got the 9000 series and a couple other chips here, Shannon, but a first reaction to the uh, to the laptop chips. I'm I'm pretty excited about them just in terms of processing from like a content creator perspective because I feel like these are going to really help with like productivity on the go mm -hmm. as well as hopefully battery power as well. Like we we already know that Qualcomm is really touting their battery power and I'm hoping to see very similar um, scenarios when it comes out of Ryzen 2. So of course that's going to take a lot of testing and we're not going to know for sure until we see a lot of those reviews coming out out for all these new laptops, but I'm definitely looking forward to it. All right. That was the thing AMD wanted you to pay the most attention to because AI and Copilot Plus, but the thing enthusiasts seem most excited about was the Ryzen 9000 series, also built on the Zen 5 architecture, next in line for CPUs for desktop PCs, also coming in July. Uh, AMD announced the 8040 and 8000 series just in April for AI workloads. Uh, so AMD is picking up its cadence as well, planning new AI tech every year now as well. The Ryzen 9 9950X is the flagship, 60 cores, 32 threads, 80 megabytes of L2 plus L3 cache, and a 5.7 gigahertz boost clock. Uh, AMD claims this is up to 16% more instructions per cycle. Uh, Roger, this got the actual people on the street excited. This is this is the first uh, uh, high-end high multi-core AMD uh, processor that's come on the new architecture. Just for comparison, the Threadripper those processors start at 12 cores so this the, the this chip already overlaps that so it is a super exciting product because people have been waiting for this for at least a mm -hmm. year um and it's very interesting because AMD is taking kind of this dual track uh, uh with the AI uh with the Ryzen AI 300 and the 9000 series 9000 is definitely towards the PC enthusiasts the, the home builders or specialty boot, boutique PC, PC makers 
while the Ryzen AI 300 is, it's definitely marketed toward uh, commodity OEM laptop builders because they want to make sure they get their share. People may not realize it, but Intel and AMD make a bulk of their chip sales to those OE, OE, OEM vendors. So making sure that a Toshiba or uh, a, a Fujitsu or whoever's laptop has an available AMD processor means means more sales for them. Uh, but again, it's it's very interesting. AI with with Windows Copilot plus PC really pushing it. That you know, it's it's a general impetus where you need to have AI as a feature set. Whether or not the end user actually uses it, it needs to be. It's now you need to have it as a checkbox. Yeah, uh, Shannon, you've been doing some some PC building. Those nine thousand series look good to you too. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> I mean, like Roger had mentioned, just seeing that these are starting with with higher cores is is very exciting from a PC builder's perspective as a gamer and as a content creator. Um, the last time I built a PC was back in 2020, and we didn't have any AI hardware, so to speak, when I built my last machine. So this time going into it, it's it all it's really exciting, honestly, like as a PC builder, never being able to, you know, include these kind of components into my machine that have AI built into them, or have those capabilities built into them and the, uh, those, those abilities in the chipsets. So it, it's going to be really fun to come into this from like almost a fresh perspective of like, what do I want? How am mm -hmm. I going to use AI? And is this even something that I'm going to use? Or is it just going to raise the prices of these components that I've been so used to over, you know, since it's, I was a kid? It's very interesting you say that because AI is one of those once in a generation technologies mm -hmm. that sort of forces people to upgrade. Do you have does, a PC yeah. that's pre-AI or is it AI enabled? And it, it is very telling that you know uh, Windows is sort of pushing that with with uh, with Copilot Plus PC and Windows 11 uh, when they were flogging the the Qualcomm uh, their uh, uh, Qualcomm powered Surface laptops. Yeah. Uh, it is going to be in a very important. You're going to see a lot of it. Whether you're Best Buy or online, you see AI flogged everywhere as again a tick box, tick tick checkbox on a, a pc a pc spec yeah and arms out there saying they expect 50 percent of the pcs in the next three years to be shipping with arm processors not x86 processors yeah. too so a, a amd and intel are needing to work hard to convince you that you still need their x86 processors uh just to round up the announcements if you're a data center builder which i know a couple of you out there are uh the instinct mi350 series is the next gen architecture coming in 2025 and the mi400 series planned for 2026 and the fifth generation of epic server processors is coming in the second half of this year that is also built on the zen 5 architecture and it will have up to 192 cores and 384 threads. All right. One of those th features in a Copilot Plus certified PC with those NPUs that have 45 tops or more uh, is Microsoft Recall. Uh, if you don't remember, Microsoft Recall is that feature that will continually take screenshots and then do OCR. So they're not, uh, people are like, that's going to take up a lot of space on my hard drive. They're just doing optical character recognition, scanning in data and training machine learning algorithms to understand what you've done in the past. Uh, and it just does it constantly so that you can say, what was that green thing that I looked at? And it'll be able to tell you what the green thing you looked at on the web is. Uh, I defended it when they announced it because a lot of people's reaction was, I don't want Microsoft knowing this about me. And I'm like, they did a pretty good job of making sure Microsoft would not know this about you. Uh, it's just a matter of whether it's as secure as they say it is. And maybe I undersold that because security expert Kevin Beaumont has found a way to exfiltrate his own recall database. He's uploaded it to a website that is searchable by anyone with access to that website just to show this is what could happen to anyone. Uh, the problem is that the database is accessible from the app data folder if you're logged in as admin, which, you know, best practices don't always be logged in as admin, but a lot of people are. And that data is stored in plain text in an SQLite database. That may not be as easy to access as it sounds in practice, but Beaumont figured out a way. He has informed Microsoft of that way to give them a chance to address it. Uh, and he will, he's not making the details ready yet. Uh, but, you know, anytime you're saying plain text, I get it. 
uh, Microsoft is saying, look, it's encrypted at rest because you have BitLocker on or you should, right? But what Beaumont showed is like, yeah, but it's not encrypted when you're using it. And if it's not encrypted when you're using it, if someone else gets in your machine, then they can also access that, which is true of everything all the time, right, Shannon? But if it's taking screenshots of everything, it's going to be storing in plain text things like passwords, for example. Yeah, absolutely. I'm so glad that you brought this up because I've been, I've had concerns about recall, especially because a lot of my like real world friends have brought up their own concerns and they have nothing to do with like the tech nerd or cybersecurity community whatsoever. They're, they've just heard about this on like their local news. So the fact that people are paying attention to this so much so that we're having cybersecurity, the cybersecurity community, community really delving into it to find these vulnerabilities is so important. I feel like with Microsoft, they have this like narrow path, this idea of we need to make this thing accessible and using recall, I can understand why it would be so useful. And it sounds really cool. But the problem is, yeah, they're not going to, they don't like, maybe they're not collecting your data. And yes, it is encrypted at rest, but you always have hackers who are trying yep. to find a way into things. <laughs> and that's what the cybersecurity community is looking for because they think like hackers. Yeah. So the fact that Kevin was able to find this so quickly too is definitely a concern. And I immediately thought about how if you have access to this information in plain text while you're using the com computer, what's to stop somebody if you leave while you're at like a, a coffee shop or something and you go grab your coffee when they call out your name what's to stop somebody from plugging in like a usb rubber ducky or something and and uploading all the plain text data up to their own server yeah. while you're still logged in because chances are you're leaving that computer logged in for a few seconds when you walk away and it only takes a few seconds to use something like that so like yeah. there's there's a major concern there <laughs> no no granted the the reasonable pushback is like that's also those are all vulnerabilities for your data right now, right? And and that's true. Uh, if you have any data on your Windows laptop right now, someone can get in there and exfiltrate it. Uh, if you walk away from the coffee shop and you're logged in on your computer, somebody can get in and exfiltrate it while you're up at the coffee shop, which is, you know, why you should make sure you log out or, or you know, turn, turn on password notification, whatever. Those are all true. I think the issue here is this is a lot more data <laughs> in a mm -hmm. lot more accessible form than what would be on your on your laptop otherwise. And a lot of the data that you're talking about, you would encrypt. Now, granted, typing in a password often is obfuscated, uh, but it might not be. And it, <laughs> We're talking about worst case scenarios, not regular case scenarios. It seems to me that Microsoft took the position of the per the performance hit of encrypting the SQLite database it, when you're using it was enough that we don't think most people will be vulnerable to this. But my reaction is the amount of data it will have on you is more than you can contemplate right? Because it's constantly capturing things. And so this isn't like, well, I know what data I'm keeping on my device and I'm willing to take that risk. Uh, and everything you're doing becomes a risk at that point. So to me, I would turn it off until they address this. Uh, and, and the other thing I should point out too, is I was under the impression that you would be given the option to turn it on or off at setup. They just make you click into settings to turn it off and set up. Most people aren't going to know to do that. So I think they need to change that too. make it an option of like, hey, Microsoft Recall is going to be on. If you'd like to turn it off, click here. I'm, I'm fine with it being opt out uh, for people. I think it'd be better if it's opt in because opt in is always better. But the way they have it now, people aren't even going to be knowing it's running. I I disagree. I would very much prefer that it be opt in. Uh, just like anything else that could spark a vulnerability on your machine. Uh, so so we differ on our opinion there. And I would, uh, if anything, this is going to give me some definite, definite content fodder for my channel because yeah. I'm absolutely going to make some videos about how to turn it off. <laughs> what Shannon and I agree on is you should turn it off. You should figure yes. out how to go in that setting. Yes, or turn it off. better yet, Microsoft <laughs> should make it easy for you to know whether it's on or off in the setup uh, and give you the chance to make sure that it's off, whether it's opted or opt, opt out, do that. Uh, and and also address this SQLite thing. It, it, it needs to be encrypted while you're using it. Sad, sad to say, but... <laughs> I think so. I, I, I think it should. Uh, 
We talk about stuff on the show based on our subreddit. This this story was submitted on our subreddit. Uh, one way to let us know what we, uh, what you would like us to talk about is to go to dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com and just you can vote on the things other people have submitted. Uh, R.W. Nash and a bunch of other people are in there submitting stuff. So get in there and join them at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. Big moment in YouTube history happened this weekend as Jimmy Donaldson, a.k.a. Mr. Beast, you probably know him better as Mr. Beast, passed Indian music label T-Series to become the largest YouTube channel by subscribers, 269 million subscribers. Uh, T-Series had held the top spot for five years ago after they passed PewDiePie. And last month at Brandcast, Google's annual showcase event for YouTube's content and products, YouTube CEO Neil Mullen told audiences, creators are the new Hollywood. They're reimagining classic TV genres from morning shows to sports commentary, and they're inventing entirely new ones. Mullen wrote in The Hollywood Reporter earlier in May that the Emmys should include YouTube creators. Uh, Shannon, what do you think? Are YouTube shows a new kind of entertainment distinct from TV movies and streaming shows? You know, I I think they are. And I kind of base that opinion on my own perspective as a viewer as well as a content creator. So discussing this topic as a content creator is so interesting, just knowing that like when when Neil or when Jimmy makes these big changes, when Neil is talking about, you know, being the CEO, the head of YouTube, and when Jimmy's talking about being the biggest channel on YouTube and all the, you know, statistical analysis that he's done, they're talking about my job. And that's, it's really cool to see how I'm a part of this career in this industry that is making so many changes to how we act as a society, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, it does. Uh, I have noticed uh, that a lot of the categories of tv that are not scripted uh so you know food travel reality shows etc are well represented on youtube uh and in fact a lot of shows that are on tv also put their stuff on youtube in those categories specifically because they know that's where where the audience is going um we, you know some of it you could argue like, oh, so YouTube's just taking over for home and garden. You know, it's just taking over for the travel channel and and discovery channels and 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 all of that sort of thing. But some of these categories are brand new. Oh, absolutely. I mean, one of the ones that I could think of immediately is just like uh, movie and TV reviews. So people will have an entire YouTube channel dedicated to reviewing shows that they have watched on Netflix, or they went to the theater and watched a movie or saw something on Hulu. And they come to YouTube and do review and commentary about this this thing. And you don't really see that on traditional television as much show as just the original uh, content. So here you're seeing a lot of people doing the reactions and doing the commentary and do doing the like documentaries about these different things that have come out. And this is where like whenever I think about like creating products on YouTube or watching YouTube as a viewer, like th that's where my mind wanders is what kind of commentary can I give that will further like give my viewers something to experience rather than just something that they can watch. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, you could argue, I, I immediately heard someone somewhere in our audience going like, ah, Siskel and Ebert were doing movie reviews a long time before YouTube ever existed. And that's absolutely true, but mm -hmm. it's the expansion, right? You don't have as many of those kinds of shows on broadcast TV or cable TV as you used to. And they are generally movie focused. Uh, they, they aren't usually as TV focused. You get onto YouTube though, and you get not only TV and movies, but old, new, uh, niche, uh, documentary oh, yeah. making of commentary. And it does range in quality. You know, I think a lot of people still think of YouTube as equivalent to cable access TV, but uh, the quality of these shows is, is while there are many that are still there, there are many that are absolutely studio quality productions. 
and even one of the things that I've seen more of just in the past like year or two is how people are playing into like authenticity. They really want to find creators who are authentic or who are somebody that they can really relate to as opposed to just celebrities. For the longest time over the past decade, we've seen a lot of YouTube content creators who have turned into celebrities. And even Neil's like, oh, we should start considering like having Emmys for YouTubers, like YouTubers should be included in the Emmys. And that's all, you know, fine and glorious for the larger content creators and the people who have become that the part of that train. But there's so many people that have, you know, smaller accounts, smaller subscriber status, but they have tons of views because people find them to be extremely authentic. Mm -hmm. And I think that's so interesting to see that kind of content divide between traditional television and movies and what you see now with YouTube, where people are more interested in divulging content or, or um, ingesting content from people that they really relate to, that they see as somebody online who they could be a friend with. Yeah, th that is one of the challenges. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, you could change the Emmy rules to include YouTube. Uh, and there's a lot of, you wouldn't even have to add that many categories, right? You could add a vlogger category, perhaps a few other categories, but most of the categories are adaptable. Uh, but how do you decide who qualifies? Is it subscriber count? Is it some other, you know, there might be a very quality channel deserving of an Emmy that doesn't have mm -hmm. a lot of subscribers out there. And there's a lot to wade through. There's a lot more content on YouTube than there is on cable television. Uh, so that the, the, the nomination process would be fraught <laughs> with lots <laughs> of arguments about where that line is drawn, I think. <laughs> would be. And if we're even just talking about like, you know, basing YouTubers getting into the Emmys uh, based just on like how many viewerships they actually get, uh, that those numbers are growing, especially on televisions, like on physical TV screens. Um, I, I also wanted to mention, according to Nielsen right now, YouTube viewership in on US TVs alone has increased. It accounts for 9.7%. That's in 2024, and yes. that is up from 7.8% in March of 2023, and that's up from 6% in March of 2022. So the amount of people who are sitting down like in front of a TV screen and watching YouTube as something that they can like sit back and relax and kind of ingest at that time and relax and watch – or even on like family televisions, like they're yeah. going to YouTube more often than they are just watching on mobile screens. And that's even very important from like a content creator perspective, too, is how do we change how we're producing our content to kind of focus on the people who are watching on these bigger screens now, as opposed to just the mobile content creation? Yeah. Um, those numbers, by the way, uh, YouTube is passing Netflix on televisions. That doesn't count that's watching crazy. YouTube on your phone or your laptop. Yeah. That's that's just on televisions. It, it is quite big. And I see a lot of people asking the legitimate question of like, you know, but why are creators not able to make money? Um, I think that is a question for another day <laughs> for us to dig <laughs> into. Uh, but to me, the question isn't why aren't creators to able to make money? It's what is the distribution of creators that are able to make money? Because Mr. Beast is worth around $500 million as of 2022. Oh, wow. So at least one person is making quite a bit of money uh, on YouTube. And there's, there's yeah, I'm not quite there yet. I'm not yeah, one me of either. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's check out the mailbag. Oops, that's not the mailbag. This is the mailbag. Hi, DTNS crew, says Mike in Dubai. I appreciated the discussion on historic precedents for restricting technology to foreign competitors. While I agree in principle that limits on trade and tech are not good, I think it's crucial to point out that the U.S. has few restrictions on tech transfers to other East Asian countries than China, uh, such as South Korea, Japan, and Taiwan. Those compete with U.S. manufacturers. You are correct that many of the restrictions are political, but it's also linked to security concerns. The People's Republic of China is a near-peer adversary at the point and sending tech they strag struggle to produce right their way is self-defeating. In other words, sending them tech that they could use against the United States is self-defeating to the United States. Um Mike had a lot more in here that was really good, but uh, just just trying to keep it brief. Uh, great point, Mike, that it is not just an economic concern on these restrictions. It is also a security concern. And when I said it was political, I was including security in there as sort of 
the politics writ large of government operation. Uh, but you're right. It's it, political is often seen as just electioneering and, and winning points. And, and there's that part of it. Uh, there's other parts of it, too. So thank you for pointing that out, Mike. Appreciate it. And thank you, Shannon Morse, uh, for being here today. What you got going on these days? Oh, I have a lot of really good videos coming up. But most recently, uh, somebody in my in my family was targeted in an identity theft scam. So mm. it inspired me to make a video about how to protect yourself from identity theft. Uh, you can find it on my on my YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash Shannon Morris. It's the newest video that you can watch on there. That's a good one. Check it out, folks. And patrons, stick around for the extended show, Good Day Internet. We're going to talk about what we watch on YouTube on our televisions uh, versus regular old TV. So we, we talked about the industry. We talked about creators. Uh, we're going to talk about our own viewing habits and, and compare them and how they've changed over the years. So stick around for that. You can also catch the show live Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. Find out more about that at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow. Until then, have a good one. Just one. The DTNS Family Podcasts. Helping each other understand. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>